I think that we have failed you. We have told you that an education is something you receive. We've taught you that learning starts at 7.45 a.m. and ends at 3 p.m. and then life begins. We have made learning and life so separate, in fact, that a recent study found that only 23% of high school students very much believe that school helps them solve real world problems. 23%. This is appalling. Right now we tell you there's this huge, beautiful, complicated world out there. We teach you the physics of how it works. We ask you to consider universal truths that span humanity. We introduce you to various histories of people and cultures. And we have you learn to communicate in other languages. But we do it all from within the confines of a concrete building. We try to teach you about the world by isolating you from it. It doesn't make any sense. Learning in life should be indivisible. We should have the sense that we can learn from anything, that each experience we have can legitimately teach us, and that the world, and not one single building, is our school. Imagine a school that creates this for students. Imagine learning poetry by shouting it over the ocean, studying the civil rights movement while traveling from Birmingham to Selma to Montgomery, exploring geology and tectonic movement while standing on top of a mountain you just climbed. And imagine doing this with a group of students from around the country whose backgrounds speak to the diversity that exists within this country. For the past three years, two other people and I have been building just that school, one that makes the nation a classroom. It's a school that travels the country and engages the people we meet and the places we visit to learn history, literature, science, and language. It's a school that empowers its students to have ownership over their education. It's called the Field Academy. People frequently ask me why I started the Field Academy, what the story is, how it happens. And there are, of course, many reasons. There are many stories, and there are many ways that it happened. But there's one story that I come back to a lot. It's about a dude ranch. When I graduated from college, I wanted to do something different. I wanted to meet new people, I wanted to have an adventure. And I wanted to learn how to ride a horse. So, with my new college degree in one hand and a pair of rubber gloves in the other, I went to Colorado to work as a housekeeper on a dude ranch. I made a lot of beds and I scrubbed a lot of toilets. But the most memorable part of it was the unexpected education I received from the five wranglers who worked with the ranch horses. They were from all over the Midwest and the South, and they ranged in age from 20 to 50. They wore cowboy boots and jangling spurs, tight jeans, and massive belt buckles. They chewed snuff, they rolled their own cigarettes, and they all knew how to waltz. From them, I learned how to tie a bridle out of a rope, I learned how to flip an egg with a frying pan, and I learned how to ride a horse. But the most significant thing I learned was about the complexity of the United States. These Wranglers were from a population I had never known. They were the sons of ranchers and cattle farmers. One of them, Nick, had grown up on a cattle farm in Kansas. And when we started talking about international policy, I suddenly realized how different and how understandably different our perspectives were. If Japan stopped buying US beef, Nick's family was immediately threatened in a way that I, the daughter of a doctor and a lawyer in Seattle, never would be. When I talked about international policy, I talked about human rights and global justice. And while Nick may have had similar concerns, primarily his beliefs came from what impacted his family. So while I didn't always agree with his opinions, I at least began to understand why he held them. And this was a startling realization, and it was totally embarrassing. It had taken me 22 years to realize that when people believed things that were different from what I believed, they did so with good reason. When I graduated from college, I was pretty sure that I knew what learning was. I had been among the top of my class in high school. I had gone to Yale. I had received an education, and it was one that I loved. But it took these five cowboys out in Colorado for me to realize how much more extensive my education could be. And that's why I started the Field Academy, because I wanted other people to know that they could learn anywhere, 
in the middle of a concrete building, at the top of a mountain, on the saddle of a horse. And I wanted them to know that not when they were 22 and out of college, but when they were where you are in high school. Because this is what I realized. Learning can be ubiquitous. It can happen everywhere, but that's a choice you have to make. Education is not something you passively receive. It's something that you actively seek. A lot of high school students have told me they can't wait for high school to end. They can't wait to stop staring out the window, checking their clock, writing papers that seem irrelevant. They can't wait for all that to end because then life will really begin. And that makes sense. That makes total sense. But here's the challenge. Your life already has begun. And it's on you to figure out if your education has too. Thank you.